weight and balance. <laughs> For the official recording now. Um, okay. So we're talking about the CRJ700 weight and balance. Um, from um, as dispatchers, when you the very first thing you do on an air, on on a flight plan is you start taking a look. The very first thing you look at is going to be the passenger load on the plane. Okay. So when you start um, when you start looking at it, the from from the very if it, I guess there's been a few of you that have gone in and observed some of the dispatching before. So those of you who maybe have seen it a little bit, you kind of see that there's like a, a line of buttons along the top that they kind of just go pressing these buttons. Um, for those of you guys that have not seen it, I'm just trying to help you guys vis visualize a little bit. But um, when we do a flight plan from start to finish, there there's like a series of um, the software we use has a series of buttons along the top of the screen. And the very top left button being the first thing that you, you do as a dispatcher is you hit the button that says load. Hit that button, it brings it up, and it'll tell you how many passengers are supposed to be on the flight. Um, from the planning we do at SkyWest, that passenger load number gives you both the paying passengers and the standby passengers, or how many are at least listed. So um, the reason we do that, obviously, is because we know that if there's five open seats and five standby passengers, that the plane's probably going to fill up. So we don't want to just know just the paying passengers when they're going to throw on non-revs, right? Throw on standbys. So um, sometimes you'll kind of get uh, like a weird number on there. It'll say like way more passengers than the plane even holds, but it's just adding up like the, the total amount of people that are, you know, waiting to get on the plane, even though, it, you know, we can only take 70 or whatever the plane holds. So, Anyway, so that's the very first thing you look at. Now, for a dispatcher, we assume that every passenger takes two bags with them. Or sorry, not – let me backtrack. Every passenger takes one bag, one 30-pound bag. So if you have 70 passengers, we assume 70 bags. We also don't differentiate between kids, um, infants, lap children, anything like that. So if – if we see that 70 people bought a ticket to get onto the plane, then we just assume they are all adults and that they all have one 30-pound bag. Now, that obviously might be different. You know, my, if my family's going, we probably got like, you know, way more bags than people and two car seats, you know, a stroller and, you know, our kitchen sink. So... Um, so obviously some people will offset that and then there's some people that don't take any bags. So it kind of, we just kind of just go, go at it with an average, right? So we just say one bag per passenger and everybody is considered as an adult in the dispatch world. We, and even in the pilots, you know, when they actually do the numbers and Andrea mm -hmm. can probably also attest to, to this because she directly also gathers some of this information for the pilots when, um, when they're doing the actual passenger count on the aircraft, but we don't like we don't weigh everybody when they get on the plane. Obviously, everybody should know that they're not hopping on a scale. Um, like right out front of the door, like the line. Now, in some cases, in some cases, we do weigh. If we're not doing a 121 operated flight, so does everybody kind of know at this point what the difference is between 121 operations? And like when I say the, throw out the term 121, does anybody does everybody know what that means? So when we talk about the federal aviation regulations, they look at airlines as different um, different carrier types. So like an airline that carries passengers is considered a 121 operation. It means that the FAR regulations, FAR Part 121 are the rules that are set aside for airline operating with passengers, you know, airlines that people pay to carry you from point A to point B. So that's what a 121 operator is. It's just basically an airline. 
Now you have 135 operators, you have part 91 operators, you have, there's a whole bunch of different types of operations depending on what you're doing. Um, if you are a non-scheduled airline, let, let's say you're in a, you own a plane and you um, just occasionally do charters, you know, for the local basketball team or whatever. But you're, it's not like something that the public could just look you up online and buy a ticket, right? Not non-scheduled service. Things like that, those fall under a different category. Those are the Part 135 operators. Um, but anybody that has scheduled airline service that carries passengers, that actually has a schedule, like I can look out a month from now, the schedule of the flight on that day is going to be 7.30 a.m. They have four flights, whatever. So scheduled airline service is part 121. That's what that is referring to. So now in 121 operations, you are allowed to, to assume passenger weights. Okay. And what that means for us is that each airline kind of comes up with their own weight configuration. We're going to look at SkyWest the way they, they do it. For SkyWest, we say that every passenger, every adult passenger during the summer months, which if you look up here on this thing or if you look on your sheet, you see the top right hand up here. You see passenger weights. You see summer, and you'll see a column for winter. So from – I'm going to zoom in. <laughs> What's that? Correct. <laughs> From May 1st to October 31st, we say that every adult passenger weighs 190 pounds on average. And during the winter, yeah, they weigh 195. So when you start looking at your numbers here, you go all the way up to 70. 70 passengers during the summer would be 13,300 pounds. That's just basically 70 times 190. So that's the first thing we want to know is how many passengers do we have on the plane? Yeah. So if you're trying to like list for a non-rep flight during the summer and it takes, you know, maybe a little pocket one, it says because of peak that flight loads might be limited, you might have a small chance of getting. So I would have assumed it was just on that experience that weights would be higher in summer. Why is it opposite? Um, that thing that you're seeing, like that little warning thing that yes. pops up, is is more directly related to the engine performance of the planes and basically the overall um, payload capacity that they can carry based on the temperature, the outside temperature, and the elevation of the airport. So. That will restrict if you have if what the, the air message you're seeing is is when it's really hot at a high elevation city like Salt Lake City is a perfect example. You'll anytime if if you're ever on listing for a Delta flight, you'll see you know caution due to you know weight restrictions during the summer months. You know Salt Lake City takes weight penalty hits. And it's basically just – and we're going to talk a lot about this later on when we get into the flight planning stuff. But it's basically during the summer months when you get really hot temperatures and Salt Lake being a high elevation airport, that combination is kind of a, is an engine performance killer. And what that does is if they have a weight penalty on it, it'll the penalty comes directly off of the payload capacity, which basically means that like in a non-rev situation, even though there might be – seats available um, the first priority obviously is going to get paying all paying passengers will be on but if if it hits up against its max like let's say just as an example if you're trying to go Salt Lake to Paris you're trying to go on a long-haul flight and this I pick on that one because that's one that commonly gets weight restricted but really any flight out of Salt Lake can get weight restricted or Denver, any any high mountain city during the summer. So um, they'll come up with the numbers and they'll say like it, it's the dispatcher that actually comes up with this number just so you guys know. But they'll they'll come up with a number based on their their load uh, and their 
math that they're doing on their software and it'll say that the plane on this given day at that time with the temperature expected to be whatever temperature that it can only take 150 passengers even though the plane holds 180 so they're going to restrict the plane to, to 150 because the engine performance due to the temperature and the elevation can only carry that much and then the fuel obviously too how do they do that if you've already sold 180 tickets or whatever? They pay you to either get reaccommodated, yeah, or they buy you a ticket on another flight, or they have you go the next day. I mean, there's a little whole slew of things that they'll do. It's a whole, like, uh, doctor thing, you know, you got kicked off. And exactly. Yeah, but that was because... Like a big deal. Yeah, but just that's, like, what happens. So you don't have to take, like... I mean, let's say like a 400 pound guy comes onto the plane. You don't take that end up back at all. You just guess as you say, oh, no, he weighs so 190 average, pounds. No, because average, most girls don't weigh 190 pounds. I was going to say, 190 pounds. Yeah. Yeah. So it yeah. depends out pretty It's much. really the... I've just seen it's like, I don't know. No, I was it does. Some huge people on yeah, but how many for how many huge people you see, there's probably <laughs> 10 times that amount that are under 190. Yeah. So it compensates for it, and I'm sure... I'm sure Andrea probably has some really good examples of exactly what we're talking about. When we do when you're, go when you're strapping something in and there's a second expander, you really learn how big someone really can be on an airplane. Well, they should be paying for two seats. Should just be more. Usually they are at that point. Yeah. Question on that really quick to both of you. Yes. So the I, I haven't flown a lot, but <laughs> When someone has to buy two seats, do the like, do the armrests come off or something? Uh, no. So if a passenger buys two yeah. seats, they're allowed to put the middle one up, but the fuselage, the armrest next to the fus 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 fuselage, is never allowed to be up. And then, and obviously the Skywest we by the different carriers and there are different rules and I tend to lean towards the common one. We don't allow aisle armrests to be up either because the cart can hit them, I can hit them. And when they're just hanging out in the aisle, like on a 200, you can't fit down the aisle. Right. So, um, but if they buy the second seat, which then I'm sure Adam will get into, it also goes into like our weight and balance because we'll, count it as an open seat, but, but the gate will have like, oh no, you have 80, you know, you have 70 people. Well, no, I have one open seat. Then they have to go back. Oh yeah, that passenger bought two seats. So then we count them as two persons, the pilots. I just didn't know that they even detached or went up because there's yep. been seats where I'm like by family and that would have been nice, but maybe it was just the Like the middle one? Had. The middle yeah. one goes up. The middle one just goes up, yeah. But the other two down. Sometimes. Not in the rows usually so or usually exit rows and bulkheads don't go up it depends on the aircraft type too gotcha okay that sucks yeah yeah like the front row of the 200 those don't go up but the emergency row on the 200 does but yeah depending on the airplane okay. uh like on a, on a mainline jet on the bigger ones the emergency exits usually don't go up that's just there's just those they're fixed yeah. and they have i have the weird tray tables too They'll come out of the seat. Oh, yeah, they slide up. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so like in that case, where somebody, if somebody's big enough that they bought two, then obviously they now are 380 pounds, uh, allotting for that, right? Or 190 plus 190 if that's 380. Which one would do that, though? Is there a point, though, Andrea, where somebody will is so large, let's say that they're really big, they didn't uh -huh. buy an extra seat, What's done in that situation? I've always wondered. It is awful. It is the worst thing oh, ever. I don't know. I always um, because you're shaming. I've had, I've, um, it, it becomes a problem usually unless we can get someone to give up a seat. Um, that person gets removed and rebooked. I've had to remove, I think, two, one was so bad. She couldn't fit. We were on the, the Alaska CRJ 700, and we had the two closets, you know. Uh -huh. She she couldn't fit down that straight forward. Oh, wow. 
and she knew pretty quickly that, that there was going to be a problem, but then they had to rebook her. And usually, I mean, it is like so sensitive, you know, but they usually come down to rebook. Usually they'll just give them the seat, like they'll rebook them on a bigger aircraft if they can, but there is a charge, but some, in that case, I believe they just booked her where there was an extra seat, but they they, they usually have to pay, but. Wow. It, it's coming, it happens, or sometimes if the people are traveling with another person, the other person's like, oh, I'm fine with them hanging over me, like they're used to it. But yes, I've had to remove people, and it is, it's heart-wrenching. Yeah. yeah, I can only imagine, yeah. So anyway, so yeah, so we we just give a certain weight, and in, in most cases, the dispatch planning, question, comment? So my question before everything that you explained about it, like I already knew, my question was more like why do they assume lower in summer weights rather than like compensating? Like why is winter? Oh yeah, I guess we never really answered that, did we? Um, it's just because they they on average people just weigh less in the summer just from physical activity. That's what they're averages or whatever i don't know i don't know where they get the 190 number from specifically and every airline is a little bit different like whatever airline might be 200 might be 180 somewhere else but it's really the it's just the one the, di the difference of the five pounds i know is specifically just because on average people are more active during the summer burn more energy more calories and during the winter they don't and so there's like an extra five pounds so it's an actual like human weight change yeah not okay and i was thinking more of the side of like aircraft performance yeah you're going to assume a different weight because of yeah that's what i was thinking yeah on it, yeah it really doesn't have anything to do with the aircraft performance at all it's just because people are a little bit chubbier during the winter thanksgiving holidays and uh and they get their new year's resolutions and yeah and by about may they've lost it a little bit <laughs> so um, anyway, but yeah, um, but yeah, the only places you see the problem like of those error messages are really it, most places we don't take weight hits ever, regardless of the temperature. Like if we're at sea level, it really doesn't matter what temperature you're at. You're not going to normally take a weight hit unless the runway is like super short or something, something weird. But uh, the big um, the combination of high temperature and high elevation are going to be the two big penalties. I don't know if you guys, if you're ever looking at like the engine types, do you guys ever see the different engine types on the, on the 200 specifically? Yeah. You don't. Okay. Well on the engines and you'll see it in dispatch, but there's on the CRJ 200 there, they have, they're mostly, they're all the same engine and, and, uh, they have different, a couple of different subtypes, though, within the engine types. And there's one specific engine that has better performance for hot and high. But it's called, it, the engine itself says hot and high on the end of it. And that's because it's better equipped for hot and high temperatures. Like it's, it, was, it was rated higher, essentially. So, um, so we try and route those planes to the higher elevation cities where we know it's going to be hot. So... Um, but anyway, going back to this, um, so the first thing we always look at is going to be just the passenger, uh, the, how many passengers are on the plane. When we do it for real in dispatch, we just give one bag per passenger automatically. So if there were 70 passengers, we'd be planning 70 bags as well. In here, the way we're going to do it is you'll always receive the passenger number. You're always going to receive the breakdown, though, as well. You're going to receive this many adults, this many kids. So here you have the adults, that these two columns, depending on winter or summer. If you scroll down here to the bottom, you'll see this little box that says, children are 82 pounds in the summer and 87 pounds in the winter. And infants less than two years old are zero pounds. So when I'm holding my twins on a plane, and they're both, you know, one's like 28 pounds, the other's like 26. 
They are zero, technically. Um, <laughs> got 70 pounds of non-existent babies on you. So all of that overweighing, the 190, the 195, it really accounts for the people that really do weigh more and the, and the infants and, you know, all of the people that are driving the average the other direction. <laughs> So what I was going to say, though, going back to like when they do football. So we, we do a lot of football charters, like, but a charter is a 135 operation. So a lot of times we'll get, we'll get notification that, hey, we're going to be doing a charter for UCLA. For, you know, we normally don't do the football team, but sometimes we carry the equipment and like the cheerleaders on our planes. <laughs> but if we <laughs> if we are doing a charter so part 135 operations does require you to weigh weigh everything you weigh the passengers you weigh all of the baggage and equipment but in 121 you don't have to do that so you'll see the differences when you actually do it but there are occasions where you do weigh everything though and get an, an actual weight We do we do several charters every week. So during it just depends on the season, but a, we do a lot during the basketball season. Probably more during basketball season than during football season, but we do a lot of basketball charters. Um, well, no, we do part 91, part 135, part 121. All of our scheduled stuff is 121. All of our charters are going to be part 135. All of our – anything else is 91. So anything else would be like a ferry flight, like a test flight. Like if we just did an engine change and we need to test that, if we need to do a thing where we test the ADG, drop the ADG, test that. If we do a reposition flight, like a lot of times you'll see like in big like weather event situations where we do a ton of cancellations, well, those planes – and those crews end up, if they didn't fly those flights, now they're out of position where they're supposed to be for the next day. So we'll cancel a lot of flights due to weather, but then we'll do a repo. Like let's say a plane was supposed to go from, you know, from let's say St. Louis to Chicago, and the, this being the same plane, the same crew. That crew was supposed to go St. Louis, Chicago, and then Chicago to Nashville, and do and spend the night in Nashville. And then the next day they do Nashville, Chicago, you know, do a whole nother series of flights. Well, if we cancel due to weather in Chicago, if we cancel St. Louis, Chicago, Chicago, Nashville, well, then we'll do a reposition flight from St. Louis straight to Nashville instead without passengers um, because, you know, most of the people wanted to go to the hub to the to Chicago and they connect. Now, if there were any people that were supposed to go to Nashville, sometimes we'll do it as what's called an extra section, which would just be like a, would still be a 121 flight. But if not, most cases, we just do reposition flights, no passengers, and that becomes a part 91 flight. So different sets of rules. You don't have to have, you know, all of the, you don't have to have flight attendants on a part 91 flight. Um, if like in, Andrea can probably tell you, she's I'm positive she's had to do plenty of repos, but uh, um, they end up just showing on that flight as deadhead people, basically. Yeah. So our repos fun. Um, you know, I haven't actually got to do that many. I actually just did one in July. They're fun. They're just different um, aircraft, like. You notice it's different. It's lighter. The takeoff's different. <clears throat> but there, you know, I actually have really not gotten to do that many. I'm one of those few flight attendants that's only done like two or three in all my years. It's probably more of a thing of where you're based because we probably that area yeah. get big weather events. So, but yeah. as a SkyWest employee at least and, and then most airlines the employees of the airline can write on repos so if you're ever stuck somewhere and there's a repo flight that you know let's say you were supposed to go on a flight and that flight ends up canceling but it's still going to go somewhere that benefits you um skywest employees 
basically just being in the OCC. I mean, that's really those are the only people that are going to ever know that and then and the crews flying them. But so little notice, you're not going to normally know. Um, we kind of have like a little standing rule as dispatchers that anytime there's like one that affects St. George that we, we kind of like we post it like on a message board type thing that we all have access to. And it, it's, it's still really rare the amount of times they would ever even benefit anybody. But because of like Denver weather events, you know, where we do a lot of Denver cancellations, sometimes we end up doing like a St. George straight to, you know, Fayetteville, Arkansas or somewhere, you know what I'm saying? Like, um, or St. George, like the only ones I ever look for are ones that like go from St. George to like Missouri or Arkansas, like to go visit family. But there have been a few, but none that have ever like a time wise ever been beneficial. So, um, and then in the case that you're ever out, like traveling somewhere, and you know you're stuck somewhere due to weather your flight canceled or whatever sometimes you know there might be a skywest flight that ends up repoing somewhere that might somehow benefit you but uh yeah there's there's been a few like we'll do a lot of times for our charter flights um we we repositioned like from saint george like straight to like spokane or straight to like ontario um I don't know, different. We've done St. George to like Winnipeg, Canada, Calgary, all sorts of like just, just random places. But I mean, you can only imagine that's probably not normally ever going to help anybody. So, who, who are those sections along with the Delta, United, Alaska? Just it's whatever carrier had the cancellation. Yeah, whatever paint is on the airplane. I mean, when, when we do a, uh, oh, the charters. Charter. So the charters are actually set up through the mainline carrier. So it'll it'll be like United will come down and they'll say, hey, you have, uh, we're gonna have you guys do a charter for the UCLA basketball team, you know, and it's on this date. And then you know they actually give us the load information and everything. So it's, that's normally how those are set up. Mainline Delta, we just don't really know about it very well. You can, you can, and there there is a there is a site um, on TravelNet where you can actually look up the reposition flights, um, but it's like hidden, like deep deep in the depths somewhere. But yeah, if you have a PPR number on Delta, you can get on it. So anybody with a PPR number. Um, yeah, sometimes they're helpful, and, and sometimes we get random phone calls from a SkyWest employee that says, hey, will you guys let me go in this repo? And they don't know the rules. And, uh, well, you know, or a, a lot of the biggest one, though, is going to be a crew that calls that's actually operating the flight that wants to take their family with them. That's the big ones. We used to do a lot of sea check repos from Salt Lake to Tampa. Not sea check, but for modification repos. They'd send them down to Tampa. So with those ones we knew well in advance, like Salt Lake to Tampa on the 900 mods that we were doing for several months. But those ones, there were several employees that kind of got in on those and because because those ones we knew a week or so out that that airplane's going Salt Lake, Tampa, and you can catch it and you can fly on it. So When Adriana crashed, that's how everyone was getting out of Seattle, like SkyWest crew members. For all the repo flights, no matter where they could go, as long as they could get out of San Fran, because right. I was there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. During big weather cancellation events, it happens a lot. So, um, so what we're gonna do here is I'm gonna show you guys how to. We're gonna just run through a weight and balance real quick, and you're gonna just kind of see it with me doing it here the first time kind of just see what we do. Everything, essentially everything we need number wise is going to be coming right off of this sheet. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to say that we have a flight. We're going to just throw out some numbers here. So we're doing the CRJ 700. It holds 70 passengers. The one, the, the one that we're doing in class is, is a 70 passenger configuration no first class so it, it's like an all coach 700 essentially so we're going to say we have 62 adults
Now, when we do this manually, we do break it down. So we're going to say we have five kids. We're just going to use today's date, so we'll know that it's summer. Um, 62 adults, five kids. We're just going to throw out that we have 100 bags. Because we will break that down as well. So most of these, like I said, in when you're actually doing this in a real dispatch scenario, you just do one bag per person. And here we will always have everything listed separate. 62 adults, five kids, 100 bags. Um, we're gonna Is say that, the kids? what's that? Is it your bag for the kids? No. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. When we do it in the OCC, like electronically do all this, yes, we do. Okay. Everything that you see in this class, though, will always be separate. You'll get a separate number for everything on all of your flight plans, everything you do in here. So 100 bags, and we're going to say that we have 500 pounds of, uh, of cargo, just random cargo. We don't necessarily know what it is. We just know that it's 500 pounds. And then we're going to say that the aircraft has 9,000 pounds of fuel. Okay? Now, when you're doing your real flight plans, you'll actually be figuring out this number on your own. But for the sake of us not knowing how to do that yet, I'm just going to tell you that we have 9,000 pounds of fuel on the plane. So what we're going to do, and the very first thing we do, on, in this example, we don't necessarily need to know um, where we're flying to or anything like that. We're just looking at the overall weight and balance of the aircraft. So when we look at an aircraft, there is, there's a certain there's certain things that are already assumed to be on the aircraft, okay? When we were learning this last week about this that zero fuel weight that you guys memorized, 62,300 pounds. So the zero fuel, or that, sorry, the max zero fuel weight is what I should be saying. So that is the max weight that the aircraft can weigh without fuel on board, okay? So the only thing that could take it above 62,300 pounds is just fuel. Okay, so if you throw all of your passengers on the plane and your luggage and cargo and everything else, it cannot weigh, in no case can the plane weigh more than 62,300 pounds. If you're over that, there's going to be a restriction. You'll know that right off the bat. That's without fuel. The only thing that can push the 62,300 threshold is just fuel only. That's right. So that's what that weight um, means to us. So... The other part of the plane is keeping the, the aircraft itself within what's called the center of gravity envelope, okay? Generally, well, on the CRJ aircraft, whether it be the 200, the 700, or the 900, uh, most of those planes, without people on them, just they're naturally, with when they're completely empty, they're nose heavy, Okay. And generally speaking, that, that plane is a nose-heavy aircraft just in general. So a lot of times what you'll see, and, and anybody that's ridden on a CRJ or, you know, especially on the 200 is going to be the one that gives you the most problems. A lot of times when you have a full flight, um, and then let's say if you have like a jump seater sitting in the cockpit, I mean, a lot of stuff that's adding weight to the front, a lot of times... You know, they have to either take ballast and add it to the back of the plane in order to keep the, the center of gravity level, or they have to ask passengers to shift from the front to the back or move kids. I think the other day on a, the flight that uh, we were on, they moved – oh, well, you ended up moving. So what was it? They wanted three or – where was it? Six people. They wanted six people. They wanted six adults – from the front of the plane to trade spots with like people that primarily had kids from the back of the plane. So I was sitting in row four, I think. It was and, a child party at Yeah. <laughs> so I was up there. Me and my wife were up there with all of our kids. And then they made Chantel and her kids 
who were clear in the back move up to the front as well as some other people that had kids too, right? Yeah, there was those other people that had kids. Well, there was those other two that just had the kind of the, they were more older kids, but they were. Yeah. So anyway, just as an example, you got to keep the airplane within the center of gravity envelope, and you'll see what that what that is here in just a minute. Um, the only other thing when you're looking at weight and balance that we need to know here is every single airplane we deal with has um, has an empty weight. It's what's called your you'll you'll see it as O E W or B O W. In this case, on the ones that we use. On these forms, you'll see it as BOW, and what that stands for is the base operating weight. That's just the weight of the airplane, nobody on board, no, no fuel, no bags, no people, okay? That's your base operating weight. So one thing to note, the base operating weight includes, it includes the crew, so it include, includes Two, like on, in this case, two flight attendants and then two pilot crew members. It also includes their luggage. It includes um, all of the fluids on the aircraft, like the oil, um, you know, anything that flows through the engine other than fuel, okay, is included in this weight. It also, based on whatever airplane it is, like the paint that's on the airplane. So anytime they, they take our planes and they go in and they repaint them, and the ones that you see, these weight and balances that you guys see come through, is when they're done painting or if they're done, if it's a brand new plane, whatever, anytime it goes in through paint or any other type of a sea check or any type of a new aircraft inspection, it, at the very end of that, the last thing they do is they weigh the aircraft and they do the weight and balance and they get what's called the base operating weight is the weight that they give you and then the index of the aircraft. And the index is the figure that's talking about the center of gravity and you'll see what this means for us here in just a minute so in our class here we have a list of 10 different crj 700s i think it's 10. these are actual skywest crj 700s Aircraft 760, 730, 764, 748, 754. Anyway, there's a list of them here. These are the planes that you'll be using. It'll, every one of your flight plans will be on one of these planes for the rest of the class. So, what's that? Yeah, I think the 764 is in the. Hold on, real quick. 764 is my name. Okay, so we'll use that one for right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so each one of these is a plane. It just gives you the tail number, which is that N764SK, and then the base operating weight, which for that plane, now these are old, so it's probably not the current one. The base operating weight, 44,803 pounds, and the index, which is the center of gravity index, which is 71.3, okay? So... Anytime you do a flight plan, you'll be given a tail number for your flight. So like if we were given these numbers where we just listed all of these 62 adults, 5 kids, 100 bags, 500 pounds cargo, 9,000 9, pounds fuel, well, you'll also just be given a tail number at the very top. It'll just say N764SK. So you'll know that's the plane you're using, and it'll just basically be your job to look at the tail number, come to your list, and get your bow weight, that base operating weight, and your index. So we're going to use it N764 here. So if we go back up to our weight and balance sheet, we are going to... Write that in. So I believe, so right here where it says our bow weight. Um, no, save this because I'm going to just give you guys an assignment to do one on your own. And then you'll just, you'll just, you'll use that for. 
this first one we're going to just do together. So, so right here is where we type in the bow weight. My computer will ever catch up. Seriously. Okay. So four, four, eight. Wow, too far there. Eight. Oh, three. So that's the base operating weight of the plane, and the index was Is 71.3. You can't see my dot there. That's where you type in your index, though. So now the next thing we do, we're going to type in all of our other numbers here that we have. So we have 62 adults. Put that in right there. We come over here to our passenger weights and we see we're during, we're in the summertime right now. So we see how much that is. Okay. Eleven thousand seven hundred and eighty, and we have what seven kids? Five. Oh, five kids. Five times eighty-two. Never had so many issues with my computer. Okay, four ten. Nice and pretty for you guys here. Okay, so 11,780 plus 410. Okay, so we are 12,190. We don't have any infants, so you kind of just follow this little flow chart here. You see 12,190, well, that comes over the arrow, you come over and you just put that in that. Uh, Plug that number in right here. Okay, so now we need to go and figure out our index for this amount of passengers. This is the part that technically the flight attendant actually does. So there is what is called a passenger index. Uh, card. We call it a pin card. So it's page three on this document. And this probably doesn't look exactly like the one that Andrea currently uses. The one that they currently use actually has all of our aircraft on it. So it becomes a little bit confusing to use in this class because it has the 200, it has the 700, and then it has all the different types of the variants, like whether it's Delta, Alaska, United. So there's this one, which is an older one that we're going to use, which is just for our plane, and it's only the 700, and not as confusing to use. So what this is here is it has our total uh, passengers here. So we have 62 adults, five kids, there's no infants, 
So this has the zones of the aircraft that are broken down. So zone A is rows one through three. You put how many passengers are in that zone, and then you figure out what the index is for that zone. So then you have the same thing, zone B, how many passengers, C. So this is telling you that it can, it can hold up to 12 in each zone, and then the very back zone, F, can only hold 10 people. So what we're going to do is we're just going to assume that the, the plane filled up from the front to the back. We're not going to do anything anything kind of special. We're just going to say, well, as soon as we, we're going to just go from the front to the back and just kind of fill it up, just assuming that we are making our own seat assignments here. So we're going to put 12 passengers into zone A. Come down to zone B, fill it up, put in 12. Zone C, we'll just say there's 12 there. I mean, there's 67 on the plane, so there's only going to be three open seats anyway. Uh, 12 in D, um, 12 in E, and then, well, that would leave us just 7 in F, right? Does that equal 67? Well, F only holds 10. Oh. Yeah. So 5 times 12 is 60 plus 7, so it should be 67, right? 62 and 5. So we've got 62 adults, 5 kids. Okay, so now um, come down here, total it up. That should be 67. Now we need to figure out our index number. So if you go to the next page down, this next page is actually going to show us can ever get there. Okay. This is the passenger index table. Kind of shows you the picture of the airplane. It shows you, you know, pictorially zone A, B, C, D, E, and F. But this also is giving you your index numbers. So if you're in zone A and you only have one passenger, your index is going to be minus 1.6. If you have the max of 12, it's going to be negative 19.2. Then you see zone B has different indexes, zone C. And the reason for these different indexes is because based on where that zone is located on the aircraft, it's going to have more of an impact. So if you have zone A, which is going to be more towards the front of the plane, putting six people in zone A is going to have more of a center of gravity impact and if you put six people right on the wing, does that make sense? Can everybody understand kind of the science behind is, that? Is this just a uh, moment? Yeah, okay. it is. And yeah, ultimately, yes, it's the, the moment with the index. The in, you know the index comes from the moment calculation. So we don't necessarily look directly at moment. We just look more of the index factors. So, um, so zone A. 12, 12 people in zone A has an impact of what of saying here negative 19.2. So if you um, for whoever has this up, if you want to like just leave it on this page and you can tell me what the index numbers is instead of me taking five minutes just to scroll one page and going back and forth, I will type them in. Sorry if we don't do Nope. No, all of that stuff is automatically determined. So we know that if we put, like, the index number that we come up with is the calculation of, with the moment in the arm anyway. So, so they probably do that, like the manufacturing. Exactly. So the formula so on this, base. yeah, well, the formula on this knows that if we put six people in zone A, that the index, like the, the moment and arm from that weight, will equal this index, basically, if based on the 190 so, pounds. So it's basically just done on the math board. Yep. So this zone A was the negative 19.2. So 12 passengers in zone B, negative 13.9. 12 in C, negative 8.5. 
Zone D. <laughs> And he is this is a twelve. Yep. Uh, two point eight. And uh, for seven people. Uh, four point eight. Four point eight. Four point eight. Okay. So you see on E and F here how it's impossible to have a negative. So no matter how many people are or aren't in E, you can't have a negative number. It's Based, because it's behind the wing, so it actually, no matter what, it's never going to have a negative impact on the front center of gravity. So if you think of the middle of the wing being zero, or sorry, the center of the plane is zero, that's where the weight shift is, right? So that point that's zero is everything forward of zero puts weight on the nose. Everything behind the zero puts weight on the tail. You know, makes it go up, makes it go down. So A, B, C, and D... All three or all four of those zones put more weight on the nose. That's why, so everything in front of the zero, that's why you have all negative numbers there. I'm guessing D, you might be able to actually have positive numbers. Well, actually, you can't have positive. You can see it's all blacked out over here. So, does somebody want to add up the, just the negatives there? And then somebody add up the positives. Not I will. 9.2. Let's see here. So negative 19.2, negative 13.9, negative 8.5, negative 3.1. So this one here is negative 44.7. That's just adding up. A, B, anything that's a negative right there. And then adding up just the positives, 7.6. Now add those two together. You bring the 7.6 down right here and then total that. That should be negative 37.1. Everybody, any confusion as to how I'm getting this number? Okay. So that, negative 37.1, that is our passenger index number now that we've seated everybody. So that's the only one you've got to figure out on your own, that you've got to come to this card, you've got to figure out the index based on the passenger load. All of the other indexes are just going to be on the sheet, so it's actually pretty easy. So now that we're back up here, we've got that 12,190, which is our total passenger weight. Now the index on the passengers, it can be a positive, but if it's a negative, then it goes in the right column over here. Negative 37.1. Okay? Now the next two things here is our aft cargo and our forward cargo. So the CRJ700 has two different cargo bins. It has the aft and the forward. The aft is typically where we put most of the most of the cargo. The only time we normally ever use the forward is if the aft is full. Okay, so you can see right here on the sheet, the limit to the aft cargo is 3,740 pounds. So if you reach 3,740, then you're going to need to go spill over to the forward cargo, um, which only holds 1,000. So going back to our bags here, 100 bags. If you look on the left-hand column over here, you'll see if you you could just find 100, and it's going to be 3,000 pounds even. So 30 pounds per bag. We've got 100 bags. We're saying they all weigh 30 pounds. So that's going to be that 3,000 pounds. So what we're going to do here is we're going to put it all in the aft cargo. Now, when you're looking at the cargo, though, that, I mean, that's where the bags obviously go. The only thing in addition to the bags that you're ever going to need to put in there is if you have additional cargo. This additional cargo, if you may or may not have this on any given flight, but this is just going to be like random stuff. It might be 
pets. It might be mail. It might be whatever, you know, a part for an airplane. It could be anything. But if they put random cargo, non-baggage cargo on an airplane, then the rampers will actually give the, the pilot crew a little slip showing what's what the cargo is and how much it weighs. They'll actually give that to them and then where it's at after forward. So um, they're responsible to give them that as well as giving them the total bag count. So they actually, in, re, in a real life scenario, if you're the pilot, you're sitting in the cockpit, you have to wait until the flight is basically closed up and all of the final counts are done. And that's going to be uh, you're, you're waiting for two well you're waiting for three things really you're waiting for the paperwork from the station person the gate agent you're waiting for the flight attendant um, to give you the passenger count and where they're seated and that the flight attendant just has a notepad writes all the numbers down tears that off hands it to the captain captain takes it and then the ramper guy you know at the very end once everything's loaded he, he does his what's his called his CLR is what it's called, cargo load report. And same thing, it has all the bags, any cargo, where it's loaded, after forward, how much it weighs, and then the number of bags. Walks up the stairs, tears it off of his notepad, hands it to the captain. So that's kind of where all of the information is coming from. In this class, obviously, we're just kind of spitting out this information and just throw, you know, making up numbers for the sake of doing, you know, assignments. So, um, but that's, if you're in a real life situation, that's where everything's kind of coming from. So um, with the baggage, we've got 3,000 pounds in bags plus 500 pounds in cargo. So we've need got 3,500 pounds. So in this case, we can put it all in the aft because the aft can take up to 3,740. So we'll just go ahead and do that. Three thousand five hundred pounds. So assuming you had three thousand five hundred pounds of just bags, um, and then that five thousand pounds of cargo was a five thousand pound engine. Naturally, you can't put split the cargo up so you can move bags in front and put the engine in the back. Well, if it was a five thousand pound engine, then it wouldn't fit on the plane. Yeah, but yeah, if you had more bags, then so uh, you could, everything every pound you can in the back. Yeah, and the reason why you go aft first is just because the plane is naturally nose heavy. So if you're going forward, then it's going to hurt. It's going to make that nose heavy problem worse. So, yeah, so you want to try for the aft first, fill it up, and then go forward. So if you got 3,500 pounds in the aft cargo, there's a column for that. Cargo aft over here. Come down find 3,500 pounds. We don't have one for 35. There's 3,450 and then 3,510 it looks like. So always go to the one that's nearest but but over, okay? So 3,510, um, you don't, you don't want to go under. You want to go at least to the weight that you need and then, you know, if you don't have 3,500 exactly, go to the just the next one up that's closest to it. So 3,510 is what we'll use and that has an index of 23.3 so we're gonna just hey, real quick. yeah where did you get 3500 on the aft cargo so where did that extra 500 i got lost somewhere oh yeah it's it's because when i was writing up the numbers i was saying that we have 100 bags which is 30 pounds right. that's 3000 and then we have 500 just in random cargo like just oh okay I missed that oh yeah sorry okay <laughs> got it okay thank you so that's an index of 23.3 we don't have anything in the forward cargo this observer is for a jump seater so we don't have a jump seater but if we did then all you do is you just put in 190 pounds with an index of negative 2.3 so that is basically all of our non-fuel weight is is now accounted for so we just need to add these up and 
total everything up here and get our zero fuel weight. So let's do the weight column first here. We have 44,803, which is our base operating weight, plus 12,190 pounds in passengers and 3,500 pounds in baggage and cargo, which gives us 6,493. I hate this thing. It's, it's honestly... It's just this thing. Like my computer has never run this slow. It's only when I connect to this thing that it, it does this. It's really weird. And I hate Mac, by the way. Sixty thousand four hundred ninety-three. <laughs> So So now we just need to do the indexes. So 71.3 which is the base operating index plus the 23.3 so we do need to total all these up. I'm just going to hurry and get this one so I don't have to move my cursor. So the 71.3 and the 23.3 is 94.6. And then... Obviously, that's just the negative 37.1 totaled up from that one. So 94.6 minus 37.1 gives us a total index, a zero fuel weight index of 57.5. Okay. So here we are. Our zero fuel weight is 60,493. So what's the key weight that we need to be under for zero fuel weight? 62,300 is our max zero fuel weight. So we are under, so no problem there. And then our zero fuel weight index is 57.5. So once you get your zero fuel weight index, you actually need to plot it down here in our little center of gravity envelope. So the way you do that is, first of all, you go to the index. So the index is along the bottom here, and then the weight is along the left-hand column. So first, let's go to our index, which is 57.5. So here's 55, and then, let's see, so that's 60. So 56, 57, so right here in the middle, 57.5. And then our weight is 60,493, right? So I'm just going to – I try to just eyeball this on here, but I just get as close as I can. Obviously, it's a little bit easier to do on real paper, but roughly speaking, somewhere right in this area, I'm just going to put a Z, which is, stands for the zero fuel weight. doesn't need to be exact, but clearly we can tell that we are – in the middle of this big envelope. So um, you don't want to be like over here. You can kind of, if you start looking at these areas, there's this area called area A. So if, as you go this way, this means nose heavy. As you go this way, it's tail heavy. So you can kind of start to see if your index falls into these areas, that means too much weight forward and then the opposite, too much weight, weight backwards. So some of these areas here you can't cross into. So you got to stay inside of this. So right now for our zero fuel weight, we are pretty good, right smack in the middle. So it's looking pretty good for us so far. So now, next little thing here, we need to tack on our fuel. We got 9,000 pounds of fuel. Oops. 
Now we need to put, well, what effect does 9,000 pounds of fuel have? Well, we have another column for fuel, which is this one closest to the right, fuel index. If you come down, you go to 9,000 pounds, negative 2.6. Now you can kind of see all these numbers here on the fuel, not a lot of change. Whether you have 500 pounds or whether you have 19,595 pounds, there's hardly any change. Does anybody want to venture a guess as to why the fuel doesn't really change your index hardly at all? It's in the wings in the center of gravity. Ding, ding, ding. Yep. The wing, or the wings are where your fuel tanks are, which is right, right smack on, right in the center of gravity. So loading of the plane up with fuel really, fuel pretty much has no effect on center of gravity, very little. It is good to know, yeah. So really the important one is your zero fuel weight. If your zero fuel weight is in balance, your fuel is going to not really be a problem. So 9,000 pounds of fuel is going to be negative 2.6. And that is going to give us a final index. So 57.5 minus 2.6. I'm going to go ahead and start totaling all this up. 69,000, 4, 9, oops, 3. So 57.5 minus 2.6. So what's that? 55.9? 9. So what it is? 54.9? Is that our max takeoff weight? Well, not yet. We're doing the index here. So 50, is that 54.9? Yeah. Okay. So our takeoff weight is 69,493 with an index of 54.9. So, yeah, this weight, you do compare that against your max takeoff weight. So this weight here cannot exceed 75,000 pounds. Now, you can see, though, we only put on 9,000 pounds of fuel. Does anybody remember how much fuel the CRJ700 holds from your weights, if you looked at it? The plane holds 19,594 pounds. So if we put on, we could, we're only about, what, 5,500 pounds under max takeoff weight. So really, we could only put on another 5,000, you know, or so pounds of fuel before we would hit max takeoff weight. So if it was a really long flight, then you might be in trouble. In this case, we're not. We only have 9,000 pounds of fuel. So 69,493 with an index of 54.9. So we're going to plot that now. And we're going to mark it as a T. So 54.9 is going to just be right here under the 55. And 69,493 is going to be just under the 70. So it's going to be right up in this area. Let's put it as a T. So our zero fuel weight was here. Our takeoff weight is here, still well within our center of gravity envelope. The only other thing that we figure out um, is where our landing index is. And in order to know what your landing index is, you need to know how much fuel do you plan on burning. So if we put 9,000 pounds of fuel on the plane, do we think we're going to burn all 9,000 pounds of fuel? Not. Better not. Exactly. We, we have limitations. we got to land with at least 45 minutes of fuel on board. So let's just say that our plan is to burn – 6,500. That's that's what we plan to use. So we should land with 3,500 pounds of fuel on board. So there's not really a spot for that on here. So I like to just kind of scroll down to the bottom here. And first of all, I like to figure out our landing weight. So if we have 3,500 pounds of fuel remaining, how do we figure out what our landing weight is? Just, yeah, you could do that, or you could just, yeah, go to your zero fuel weight and add 3,500, right? 
So what was our zero field weight? 64.93, right? Um, yes. So 64.93 plus 3,500. So our landing weight should be 63,993. 63, OK. Now what's the max landing weight? 67,000. 67, so we're good on landing weight. The only other question is what's the index? Now remember the index really doesn't make much of a difference. So, oops. So if we land with 3,500, that's just a negative 2.0 on the index. So that just means we go back to our zero fuel weight and 57.5 minus 2.0 instead of minus 2.6. So not a big difference. 55.5 is going to be the index. Want to do that? To touch that. Okay. So so landing weight of 63,993, and then index equals 55.5. So then we just put that on there as well. So 55.5 is going to be right there, and it's basically at 64,000 pounds. So I'll just put an L right there. So that's ultimately from start to finish. That's your zero fuel weight index graphed. Takeoff weight and index graph, landing weight and index graph. So your job is to make sure that the flight from takeoff to landing remains completely within the center of gravity envelope. This one is a good example. It, it fits perfectly. You will have some that are going to be over here. If, it, if, if any of these end up in this area A, then you just need to read this right here. It says, when takeoff weight and index or zero fuel weight and index fall in area A, verify by visual inspection that the passengers are evenly distributed about the passenger zones. That's kind of the situation where sometimes they will just make sure. They don't need to move anybody in that case. They just need to make sure that things look even. Now, if it is, if it, let's say it ended up in this area up in here, this in flight that you can't come into this area. It, when it's in this area or this area back here, those are the areas where if it's, let's say if it's forward here, this is, this is where you might need to take people from the front and put them in the back. Because then, you know, you move three passengers. And if you just take an example, if anybody has the zone sheet up there or that, those indexes. So, well, not even that. If you just go back to the back to the one, just take instead of on zone A. Let's so you know those three people that we left out of the back. Let's say that we moved them from the front all the way to the back. Mm -hmm. So the front now only has nine, and the back has ten. So if we have so zone A at nine people, what's the index? Uh, negative 14.4. And what's the index on E with 10? Uh, 6.8. Okay, so you can see that it moved it moved your index by 7 points. So if you look at this here on your index, I mean, that's the difference between being, like if you were really nose heavy, that could move it from right here all the way into right here. You see kind of how that shifts around. So it, it can move, you know, just three people could move you from being, you know, not allowed to take off to being back within center of gravity. And same thing with the back. It's rare to have it back here, by the way, just because these planes are, they naturally are nose heavy. But the other thing that you can do um, is sometimes if you don't want to have to add passengers, or sorry, if you don't want to have to move passengers, sometimes what they can do as well is they can just put ballast in the back cargo. So if it's nose heavy and it's up here, sometimes they can just go get 500 pounds of like sandbags 
and they toss them in that aft cargo, as long as there's room and weight available, they can just toss that ballast and adding 500 pounds to the aft cargo will also bring that center of gravity back in. So just the ultimate idea here is just understanding kind of, you know, how to adjust things where you need to be. You're not typically going to run into very many problems. You really got to like have a really light passenger load and, you know, bag load in order to even like screw this thing up and like put it all forward. Like all, well, I think we'll end up doing like one example that has, you know, like 40 passengers. They're all seated at the front, all of the bags. We put them in the forward aft with a jump seater. Like, I mean, it's got to be like every situation working against you. So before the weight and balance is done. Yeah, if you do it before the weight and balance is done, then yes. And at least before takeoff sometimes, you know. Once you get up in the air, not a big deal. It's really just for taking off. Um, anybody have questions on this? Well, what's our assignment going to be? Well. Is it just in tomorrow's work? <laughs> no, no, I'm gonna get, you're going to do it right now in class. Oh, sweet. Yeah. So, yeah, let's do that one. but does anybody have any questions on any of this yet? Any so, if so I, real quick, I have one real quick. Yeah, go ahead. So I, it's always like the landing, the fuel, you always have to have 3,500 pounds. Did I get that right? Oh, no, no. It, that, that was just assuming. For the example. Yeah, just, and on the next one, I'll, I'll actually give you the fuel weight and then what the burn is. The burn is what um, you'll just mine okay. it to get your landing weight. So. Um, okay. But yeah, before we move on to that, does anybody have questions on it? What about that ch the chart to the left of the, the this one? Company? That's if you're adjusting passengers. I don't, I don't necessarily ever like. For me, it's easier just to look at the table and just manually do it in my head and adjust it rather than use that thing because that thing's kind of confusing because it has you times it and then. You guys want to take a break before I have you? Okay, so we'll take a break for 10 minutes, and then I'm going to drum up some numbers and have you guys do this. Okay, so yeah. So if you need to grab the numbers from, like, you should have the access to the to the rest of the forms, and then you can just write on this form. But the passenger index numbers, and then the uh, you know the tail numbers and all that the, for the bow um, figures and everything, you should have just right. And this is for selling. Yeah, today's date. Yep. Unless I'm blind, I don't see that tail number on our paper. Yeah, I don't see. Put it not on there. There's a seven four eight. Four eight. Oh, maybe I just okay. Maybe that, yeah, we'll just do seven four eight then. Okay. I was like, gosh, I already can't do this. <laughs> okay, so that should be everything you need. Just should be week four, day one. Should be a thing that says weight and balance forms for today's file. Yeah, they're on there. Really? 
Anybody else not have week four? Yeah, I, have. I do. I printed all mine too. Huh. I really wish I could figure out what those kids do here at night. I know. Why are they here? Either parents clean or something. They just hang Because nothing else does. <laughs> <laughs> you tell them that. <laughs> Unless they help them. Is this a part time orphanage? Mm -hmm. So we're filling this up just like we did the one before with the with the pin. So like the twelve from the front and then leaving it empty in the back. Oh yeah, sorry, I forgot to put that. Yes, load from forward to back. Okay. Oh okay, I was trying to. I thought we did um, do it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm yeah, sorry. I to my, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I forgot to mention that. Great question, though. So where's...
Something zero passenger that does not affect the group. Um. Because it only goes to one. Mm. <laughs> Which one only goes to one? You said? All of those ones, they only go down to one passenger. Uh, so there's zero passenger that doesn't affect the index? Or do we put it as the one? So if it's, yeah, if there's zero, then it would just be. Um, yeah, there's yeah, it wouldn't have any effect, negative or positive. It would just be what it already is. So. I'm stumped. I'm stuck. Mm -hmm. 
We have to plot what? Um, zero fuel weight, takeoff weight, landing weight, and index. Burning eight thousand or what we have left? That's what you burn. So eleven minus eight, which what you'll have left.
Relax, I guess. Um, real quick on your graphing then, do you use the index that you got at the very end or do you use the index of each thing? So like if you're doing the zero fuel weight, do you do the zero fuel weight index? They each have their own index. Yeah, so you use the individual one, not the one that is the end result, right? So yeah, and the, the one well yeah you when you get to zero fuel weight you would just graph that, that weight and index. that index okay. and then that's kind of your base index though you take that the only thing you add to that is your fuel for takeoff adjust for the index and then your fuel for landing and adjust the index that's, yeah. that's so, what I did. yeah well, what was this really for? Uh, because I did my uh, I did my weight on the bottom. Oh, you did that Okay, then I'm glad. I'm not because mine sat out there and yours is not. Well, I mean, as far as the attention is going to be on the next one. Yeah, yours looks better than mine does, but. You just have to use proper line and symbol. That's adding all that symbol. Or just drops down. Yeah. Tell me this then. So on the, um, the fuel portion, the fuel's eleven thousand. The index is maybe one point nine. So when I add that to the zero fuel index, I'm so confused because there's not even a one point nine on the graph. When you're saying the one, you're just adding the one point nine to your zero, zero fuel weight index. Oh, okay. So, so they are you're, added together. They're not all separate. Yeah, well, they're separately like, like well, well, for instance, what's together, the totals are separate? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm like, there's not even a 1.9. Yeah. Okay. That was Do you already know what this graph is supposed to look 
kind of. Yeah, I'm. What does yours look like? How do we grab it? Do you want to see the crap? Do you want us to move passengers? Um, do you need to? I screwed myself up pretty bad though, because I thought it said it was a thousand. I was like, there's no way that we can grab it. I don't know if that would have thrown off my mind. But you did fix it after your sand? Well, even fixing it is like, you know, the field of the really that's all right. I've messed up too. Yeah. Okay, good. Turns way off the chart. Yeah, minus two. Yeah, I'm doing my own. So, we're about it. So, that's my zero. Zero. I can't figure out the way I'm doing it. So, What's I'm I'm quite different than what I'm seeing. Oh really? I'm I'm good to go. Let me just see here. So I haven't done it yet. I just made up the numbers. You you gotta wait till January anyway. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to start running through this here real quick. Um, okay, so we have 51. What's the weight on 51? 9690. 9690? Yeah. Yes. Okay. And. 46. 56. Total 54. 9936. Okay. What's the base operating weight of that plane? Four four eight four eight. And the index. Okay. And the passenger was nine nine. Was negative what forty three point three or forty one point three? Wait, what? Well, well, uh, three point, I got thirty four point eight. I have forty three point three. That's what I got. Forty three point three. Loaded front to back. Front to back. Forty three point three. Front to back. Well, yeah. negative, but yeah. Negative forty three point three. 
Okay. So what is so so for fifty four people? Um, and if you put twelve, which you said was the max, from yeah. the front to the back. So nineteen point two in the first zone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thirteen point negative thirteen point nine. Thirteen point nine. And negative eight point five. Eight point five. Negative three point one. Three point one. And then six hundred mixed is positive one point four. Two point eight. Okay, so one point, the next one, sorry, was, so the negative 3.1 and then one positive 1.4, 1. 1. right? Okay, and then what? That's it. That's it. Zero. So negative 43.3. Yeah. Okay. What did everyone have in row E? Zero. How many? Six. Oh, six. Zero and Oh, yep, that's where I messed up. Yep, right there. I did zone out. That's where I messed up. Got it. Oh, really? So chill. So the bags were six. What? Sixty bags. Eighteen hundred. Then that's a okay, so point one. Then thousand. Index for the display. Yeah. Okay. 71.5, 12.1. 83.6. And those two together. Negative 48.7. Zero fuel weight total is. That's no, weird. No, the index is 30, 30, 30, 34.9. Oh, I thought you. Oh, I thought you. He's I still in the index part. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, he just said zero fuel weight. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so it's 83.6 minus. It's 34.9. Okay, so negative, or sorry, no, just positive, positive. 34.9. Okay, and the total weight. 57. Oh, he's having a conniption. Okay, and uh, the... 34.9. So what's the, just the fuel? I'm just going to skip that little part. So 11,000 is negative 1.9? Yeah. Okay. So it just ends up being 34 even then. 33. Oh, 33, yeah, 33. Okay. Okay, so 60, basically 60, 6, 8, 5, 8, 4, 3, 3.0. Okay. So yeah, so if you're 33.0, it's 69,000 almost. So 60, so 33. Yep, you're definitely clear over here. Your zero fuel weight. So yeah, so the remedy. What's the easiest remedy on this flight then? The cargo weight and cargo weight. The cargo weight. We'll shift most of it. So. So yeah, if you took all that forward cargo, yeah, so that just gets rid of negative 5.4 in the front, and then it adds, what, 1,000, so 2,800 in the back would be 18.9. So 
Yeah, so that alone shifts close to 10. So if you get rid of 5.4 and then you add what's 18.9 minus 12.1. You should just be able to go to the right side. side. So you're, you gain 12.2. So take your 33 and add 12.2 to it. Now you're at 45.2 on your index. Just by shifting the 1,000 pounds from the forward to the aft. Just 1,000 Just 1,000. So now, what's easier in the in the grand aspect of things, Andrea? If uh, if you got to move something around, the plane's already been loaded, cargo, bags, and people. What's the easiest thing to move for weight and balance? Um, people, back to front, or. So let's say. Then the pilot will tell you. They'll tell you how many they need to move and what zone from. So it depends. Usually we move back to front, like we're too heavy. So on this case, you'd have your first three rows would have to go fill up that back last three rows. Yeah. Yeah. What if? What if it's yeah? What if it's first? Yeah. The other the other option here would be they could add ballast. Yeah. So, but that's a lot of ballast. They'd have to add a lot of ballast, and some stations don't have that much ballast. So, yeah, I mean, in the time you would have to have customer service come on and do upgrades if it's that kind of, because people get upset if they don't get their upgrades. Yeah, yeah. So you do have some issues, like yeah, if it ends up if it's a plane. Now, our case, we don't have first class, but if it did end up being yeah. that situation, you. Kicking people out of first to move them to the back is not going to probably happen. So you're normally going to move if it's a yeah if it's a first class airplane then yeah you're probably going to be moving bags or getting ballast or moving the cargo. Yeah. yeah, back of the plane by the lav. Yeah. Yeah, lav duty. Cool. Well, does anybody have any questions? I'll, I'll, I'm going to give you some more of these. Um, tomorrow, um, it shows like takeoff performance and stuff like that that we're going to go over. We're actually going to combine that into a different day with flight planning. So tomorrow, I'm actually just going to give you a couple of these to do. So it's going to be a pretty light day, but I'm going to give you like three or four of these that I just want you guys to do to just kind of get this solid. So kind of a day off in a, in a little bit of a way, but you're just going to be getting, I'm just going to be giving you numbers like this, different scenarios, essentially like this, and then just want you to just run through them and, and do them. Okay. Just so you guys know what to expect, but cool. Other than that, we're done for today. Can you mention something about us not having class on? Yes. That so the, yeah, this, this Saturday will be another It'll be like an online one again. I'll just post the stuff because I've got to go to Louisville on Friday. This will be a little bit of an easier week. Yeah. Yeah, this is the point where we have a little bit of it, – it'll get a little bit better and easier. Does that mean I'm going to watch Baby 30 on Netflix this week? <laughs> hey.